Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second annual Nell Ward Lecture on Cartography. I'm C.J. Roberts, the Frank E. Duckwall President and CEO of the Tampa Bay History Center, and what a pleasure it is to have all of you with us here tonight for this very special presentation. Uh, also, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to those who are joining us virtually. Uh, it's good to have you with us here as well. You know, several years ago, we chose to name this lecture in honor of the generosity of one of our very good friends and great TBHC supporters, Nell Ward. We held the inaugural lecture back in 2019. Some of you may have been there for that. It was a terrific program. We were very excited then to plan the next annual Nell Ward lecture, and then COVID hit, which kind of derailed everything. Uh, unfortunately, we, we had to take two years off, but now we're back. We're back on track. Uh, with another great program, and I am thrilled that Nell is with us here tonight. And Nell, would you like to come forward and just say a few words? Good evening. With my teaching career having spanned multiple areas, of which was social studies, I felt like I would like nothing better than to sponsor the annual lecture in cartography. The deciding factor was Tom Touchton, without which we would not have had, had the Tampa Bay History Center. His contributing his extensive map collection to this institution and my decision to sponsor this lecture series in cartography was a no-brainer. My deep appreciation to everyone at the Tampa Bay History Center who had a hand in making this wonderful event possible for us to enjoy this evening. Now, thank you for your kind words and your tremendous support. We're grateful to you for all that you've done and for all that you continue to do, so thank you. Uh, now, without further ado, I'd like to turn the program over to Rodney Kite Powell, who is the director of the Touchton Map Library and the Center for Florida Cart Cartographic Education, and he's going to introduce our speaker. Rodney? Thank you, CJ, and thank you, Nell, and uh, thank you, Tom. Um, we obviously could not do this without you all and without you all in the audience as well. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to uh, be able to introduce our speaker, James McDougald. Uh, he and I chatted about his introduction and we don't want to spend too much time on it. I could go, go at length, but uh, suffice to say that Jim is an excellent researcher, historian, uh, and businessman. That's how he kind of came to be a researcher and historian. Um, and he really has come up with a, a very interesting and a uh, very strong theory about where Ponce de Leon uh, landed on his second voyage. And so, literally without any further ado, James McDougald. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to see my first three mentors here tonight. I didn't expect to see two of them. But I did expect to see Tom Touchton, who ignited my interest in Spanish entrada into the new world, but I found out by surprise that my two first professorial mentors are here tonight, and that's Professor Emeritus Martin Favada from the University of Tampa, and Professor Jose Fernandez, prof Pegasus Professor Jose Fernandez from the University of Central Florida, who gave me the courage to keep on with when I started on my initial research. It's great to see you here. And thank you, Nell Ward, for sponsoring this series. Um, I'm very flattered to be one of the people invited to speak. I hope I uh, live up to your expectations. Uh, and Rodney, thank you for inviting me. And Tom Touchin, uh, I've got to tell you how Tom started me on this. He was actually not asking for money, but letting me know, hey, we're building this new museum here, and you might want to support it. Uh, and uh, he said, where are you from? I was visiting my friend Tom Arthur. Uh, and Tom said, why don't you meet Tom Touchton? So I went over and Tom said, where are you from, Jim? And I said, St. Pete. He said, oh, the first inland exploration in North America. And I said, what? He said, yeah, that's where the first inland exploration in North America started, in 1528. I said, in St. Petersburg? He said, yeah. I said, I never heard of that. Are you sure? Yeah, I am. <laughs> and uh, 
that's my business to be sure. So uh, I said, well, how come I don't know about it? He said, well, it's called the Narvaez Expedition, uh, but the guy who wrote the book about it is a guy named Cabeza de Vaca. Maybe you've heard of him. And I said, yeah, in high school, I remember that name, explorer's name. He said, well, of the 300 people who landed in St. Petersburg, uh, four, only four survived. Uh, one of them was Cabeza de Vaca, and he wrote a book, and that's why we know about it, because he published a book in 1542. Uh, and uh, I really got interested in that, and I said, how come I didn't know that? So I went back over to St. Pete. I was a relative newcomer to St. Pete. and started asking my friends, hey, did you ever hear of the Narvaez expedition? No, what's that? And I said, well, 300 guys landed here in 1528. Eight years later, they ended up, four survivors ended up in Mexico City. They walked 4,000 miles in eight years to the Pacific Ocean, down down to Mexico City. And we don't even know about it. And one of them was an African slave, a guy named Estevanico. And he later discovered Arizona and New Mexico. How come we don't know that? So I decided to learn much more about it, and I read every book I could get my hands on. And uh, that's what I'm here to talk about tonight. This is a cold case file. Where did Ponce de Leon go when he went to set up the first colony in, the United, in what is now the United States? Where did he go? Nobody knows. What my advantage here is, no, there is no theory except mine. I don't have <laughs> somebody to argue against. Uh, I have a theory of where it went, and it's really like working on a cold case file. People looked at this a long time ago. They looked at it 50 years ago. A guy named Bob Fuson, a professor uh, from University of South Florida, looked at it, wrote the, probably the best book about Ponce de Leon, in my opinion, uh, resource for information. And uh, he concluded that it probably didn't happen here. And the reason he said it didn't happen here is he said, because Tampa Bay is shown on maps as the Bay of Juan Ponce, on maps that were produced 100 years later. So that's probably not very good evidence. He didn't know that the map wasn't produced 100 years later. It was pr produced six years later, after Ponce de Leon had been here. He would have considered it to be extremely relevant had he known that. So this is a cold case file. It's a file. It's something that's been looked at by historians, and they've concluded, we don't know where he went. We don't even know if he set up an ex a, a settlement. But if he did, probably he went back to where he went, landed in South Florida in 1513, and that's down in the Charlotte Harbor area, south of there, Punta Gorda, one of the uh, Sanibel Island. Uh, that's probably where he went. And that's the end of it. That's the end of the research. That's the total sum of research of where did he go in 1521 to set up his settlement. Let's see if I can push the right button at the right time. The first European colonies in today's United States were somewhere on the west coast of Florida in 1521, another one in South Carolina in 1526. We don't know where either of those landed. You will when we leave here tonight. You'll know where one of them went. <laughs> one of them was in Pensacola. It was a Tristan de Luna. All of three of them failed. They didn't make it permanently. The next one was St. Augustine, 1565, 44 years later after Ponce de Leon came here, they finally set up a permanent settlement in, in the, today's United States, here today. That's St. Augustine. Then Roanoke, it didn't make it. Uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, 1607. Jamestown, 1607. Plymouth, 1620. I'm an Easterner. We think the world started in 1620 when the Pilgrims landed. The whole Spanish part of our history is lost. Uh, and, and Fortunately, because of the Tampa Bay History Center, we're starting to talk about it and find out just how important it is to our, to our nation. The first colony that's established in the United States is significant. The first attempt for Europeans to colonize the United States happened somewhere on the west coast of Florida. We should know where if we possibly can, and that's what this is all about. There were four important Spanish expeditions to the west coast of Florida, 1513, Ponce de Leon discovered Florida, the east coast of Florida. Sailed down, around the bottom of Florida, up the west coast of Florida. And he stopped down somewhere in the uh, south of Charlotte Harbor area, was met by the Calusa Indians, who didn't like him at all. Uh, he killed four of them. They killed one of his men. He thought they had some gold. And he said, let's make peace. Let's try to make peace. So he, through an intermediary, arranged to have a peace meeting the next day. 
And the Indians said, we'll see you there. And when he got there, they attacked him uh, with 80 canoes, with Indians with 80 canoes. So it was, it was treacherous, and he left town. He, got, he left Dodge. Uh, so that was his 1513 experience. 1521, he came back to establish a permanent settlement. 1528, the one Tom Touchin told me about, 1528, Narvaez landed in St. Petersburg uh, in Boca Ciega Bay with 300 men. All but four died. He died. Uh, and then in 1539, De Soto came to Tampa Bay, to the mouth of Tampa Bay. Those are important expeditions. And unless you really de delve into this, you wouldn't realize that they are the most important expeditions that Spain made in what is now the United States. They were in attempted, three of them attempted entradas. They came here to establish a position and maintain it. All three of them failed. The 1521, 1528, 1539 failed. Not only did they fail, but the leaders died. They all died on that expedition. How my search began, as I said, Tom ignited the research. Uh, he said it's the first inland exploration expedition uh, to the United States. I thought that was exciting. Told me about Narvaez. And when I started reading about it, I found out that Narvaez, when he landed in Boca Ciega Bay, went on a day trip with a bunch of men one day up to Safety Harbor. And in Safety Harbor, he found many boxes from Castile, many cargo boxes. And nobody has said anything about it. There's been about 11 different translations of the book that Cabeza de Vaca wrote. And the translators have all said, that's what he found there. And none of them have scratched their head and said, could that be Ponce de Leon's stuff? Nobody's asked that question. I've never seen anybody ask that question. They knew de Leon came, his expedition came here in 1521. They know he established a settlement. He got run off by the Indians. If he did, he would have left cargo boxes behind. But nobody has said, could that have been Ponce de Leon's remnants? But I did. I started wondering about that. Uh, that's when my research really began. So I really had to look really closely at the Narvaez expedition of 1528, because he was the one that came here that found the cargo boxes. I needed to find out how did he get here, what did he do, did he have a map? Uh, and I started talking to people in St. Petersburg about this, and I found out that, they, that, the, that the professionals, historians, didn't believe that it was proved that Narvaez had actually landed in Boca Ciega Bay. They said, gee, you know, it could have been anywhere. Nobody's really proved where he landed. And I said, you know, I've read about 12 books on the subject, and they, everybody agrees he landed in Boca Seca Bay because the description of where he went and what he did and where the bay was doesn't fit any place else. But I still met with some skepticism, so I decided to do a project and find out everybody who had ever studied that expedition and decide where they thought Narvi has landed. So I found 35 different books that talked about it, and 33 of them said it was just north of the entrance in Tampa Bay. That's good enough for me. But then I wrote my own research because I'm a sailor, and I'd sailed up and down the coast for 10 years. I knew these places they were talking about. I'd been there, and I, I knew that there were some problems with those theories about where the Spanish came, and that is, it's really shallow here, really, really shallow. And those big boats drew 12 to 14 feet. If any of you were sailors or have a big boat, you don't want to be anywhere around here with a boat that draws 12 feet. I guarantee you, you'll run aground. So that was a problem for me when I was doing my research. How did they get here? These are, these are big boats. Well, I found out later that they didn't get here. They anchored way offshore, used small boats to get in, except Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay is deep enough to go on with a big ship if you have some guiding the way past Egmont Key. You'd go all the way, the whole length of Tampa Bay. When I was doing my research, I didn't realize it because I'm a rookie. I was breaking new ground in the questions I was asking because I went to marine scientists and asked them, is there any way you can tell me what it looked like 500 years ago here? And they chuckled and said, yeah, it looked the same as it does today. There hasn't been more than one foot of sea level change in the last 500 years. There's no difference today than there was 500 years ago, except the passes between the barrier islands. They get blown out by hurricanes and move from hurricane to hurricane. But that water's got to go in, and it's got to go out. 
There's always going to be passes there, but where those passes are, that will change. But the geography is the same. Uh, so I said, that's good to know. So if I can look at depth charts today, I'll know what they saw 500 years ago. Yes, sir, you will. So uh, then I had to find out, what do the boats draw? Do you know there's lots of books about the Spanish ships that came here? None of them say how much the boats draw. None of them. They don't say they draw four feet, two feet, eight feet, 12 feet. But one ship was built, that one, which is a duplicate of the ship that sailed around the world in Magellan's fleet. And they, they duplicated it, and that ship draws 11 feet. So I figured I'm going to use that as a peg in the ground. A ship that you could use for settlement would you draw 10 or 12 feet. So I'll use that as my assumption of where a Spanish ship could or could not go. I also talked to, uh, to astronomers. How did they navigate? How did they know where they were? Because some of the books that I've read said these guys were clueless. They would just kind of aim and sail there. Uh, one of the things I learned in my research is that historians haven't given proper respect to the quality of the seamanship and the navigational abilities of the people 500 years ago. They were exceptional, as you'll see. Narvaez, the guy that went there, came to the Indies in 1500. He fought Cortez in Mexico. There was a civil war in Mexico, Cortez against Narvaez, over who got the, the, the turf. Narvaez lost. He got put in prison for four years. He was finally released from prison. The king appointed him governor of La Florida, and he decided to come to Florida and set up a settlement. He landed in Boca Ciega Bay. I'll go into that in more detail in a minute. 300 men. Four, he died along the way. Four survived. The book, The Relacion, by Cabeza de Vaca, is the thing that everybody uses to, to know what happened on that journey. But the problem for researchers is maps. See that book? There's a coffee cup on the right. That map, in its original form, is nine feet by three feet. It's a map of the world, the Spanish map of the world from 1529. And when you put a nine foot by three foot map into a book that's this big, you can't read anything on that map. That's why all the books about maps don't have maps in them. The books from the 1800s and early 1900s, the best book of a guy, a guy named Harris wrote The Discovery of North America, 1,200 page book, 600 pages about history, 600 pages about maps, 250 maps he described. There isn't one map in the book because you can't take a map like that and put it in a book and see what it is. So historians, when they want to know what did that 1527 map have on it, they go to Harris, which was written in 1892, and they read what Harris said was on that map. Well, that maps all of North and South America. How much do you think he said about Florida? Nothing. So historians knew nothing about what the maps looked like back then because they couldn't see one. There's more problems with maps. When you look at a map like that one, they show the coastline, but they don't show the barrier islands. They don't show you water depth. You look at that and look down at Fort Myers, Charlotte Harbor, you look at Tampa Bay, you go, they're about the same, right? They're about the same, but they're not. Charlotte Harbor has an average depth of nine feet. You're not going to get a big ship. You all, anybody that sailed there knows that. You're not going to get a big ship into Charlotte Harbor. Um, so historians, when they try to figure out where did the early Spaniards go, they have to know this stuff. How deep was the water? What, what did the ships draw? I didn't find a single historian that talked about either of those. And I, but I've got 200 books on the subject. I didn't know anything, so I asked all the stupid questions, and I got some pretty good answers. I went to marine scientists to find out what the coast looked like, and they said it hasn't changed for 2,000 years. It's very shallow. There's, there, the, that black line is where the barrier islands are. Marco Island at the south, Anclote Key, the north, all barrier islands. If you're sailing offshore in deep enough water to see in the passes, you can't see them. They didn't have a telescope in those days. It hadn't been invented yet. So how do you know where to go in to find a pass? You're not seeing land. You're seeing islands. Land is behind those islands. So what they do is take their little boats and send them in, taking soundings to try to find a way in. It was a slow, arduous task to find a way to land for these big ships. By the way, the historians, the, the marine scientists that I dealt with said, no historians ever asked us this question. I thought that was shocking. 
but no historian has asked marine scientists what did it look like in Florida 500 years ago, yet they're writing books about where the explorers went. If you see it from space, this is what it looks like. Charlotte Harbor, Tampa Bay. You can see a little string of barrier islands. That's what it looked like 500 years ago, just like that. One book I found had a map. A professor from Yale University, Rolina Adorno, Sterling professor. Sterling professor at Yale means this professor is the best we've got on the subject. Yale University, Rolina, uh, Rolina Adorno became one of my mentors, the next mentor in line after Jose and Martin. And she had written a book, 1,200 pages, four volumes, 1,200 pages of fine print, three volumes, and in it was a map. It was published in 1999. It went on Amazon. Amazon was new in 1999. And somebody in Amazon put the title of the book up in Spanish. So it appeared to be a Spanish book. And it sat that way until six months ago when I got him to fix it. I've never seen that work, which is a masterpiece. It is a masterpiece of research. It took her 10 years to write. It is the best resource about early Spanish entry into the New World. And no historian that I've read has cited that work. They don't know it exists. Isn't that shocking? How do I know it exists? I bought a paperback that had been take, excerpted from that book, and I sent her an email. And I said, hey, I've read in your tape, paperback that you said such and so about Cabeza de Vaca. And uh, she wrote back, no, you must have gotten that out of my other bigger book. And I didn't want to admit to her that I didn't know she had a bigger book. <laughs> so I went to eBay and found it on eBay. And I found that masterpiece on eBay and became, I think, the first Florida historian to refer to that work in my own work. And it is phenomenal. The two greatest works I've found, by the way, one is by Henry Harris in 1892, called The Discovery of North America. And the other one is by Rolina Adorno and Patrick Charles Pouts, which is the three volume, 30 pound set of books. But in that, she had a map. And in that map, in that book, it says land that Narvaez is going to populate. It's dated 1527. I got out my magnifying glass and looked at it, and it had something on it that said the Bay of Juan Ponce. Now, she hadn't said that in her book. She didn't pay any attention to that. She was looking, writing about Narvaez. And I said, wow, there's a map that has detail about Florida in it. I need to find it. I made an annotation, I don't know if you can read it, but it has on the Florida Peninsula, Ancon Bayou, which I believe is Anclope Key. Then it has the Bay of Juan Ponce, Tampa Bay. Then it has the River of Canoes and the River of Peace. I believe that those are from Ponce de Leon's 1513 expedition, where he tried to make peace with the natives at one place. They told him to go to another place, and they attacked him with Indians in 80 canoes. And when they went back to Spain, they said, my belief is, they said to the people in Spain that were making maps, here's a river of canoes, here's a river of peace. Um, that's, why I believe, that's why I believe the Peace River down in Charlotte Harbor got its name. Here was Narvaez's territory, from Rio Las Palmas to the Cape of Florida, way more than just Florida. Here's where he planned to go. He came from Spain. He went to Jagua, Cuba, which is now Cienfuegos, Cuba. And then he launched in 1528 in February. He intended to go to Havana, pick up another ship that he had bought, and then with five ships and 450 people, sailed to Las Palmas, Mexico. That's where he was going to set up his first colony. What he actually did is this. He left there, he ran aground, he was aground for three or four weeks, ran aground again, ran aground again, got hit by a storm. He's trying to get to Havana. Strong winds from the south prevent him to get into Havana, so he just lets the wind take him north. Now, he had a pilot named Miroello. Now, that guy was good, and he had been there for 20 years. I think that his pilot knew exactly where he's going, because all you have to do once you leave Havana is find the dry tortugas. I'm a sailor, I've done this, and go due north. Just sail due north. And when you see land, 
that'll be right above Tampa Bay. Turn right, go down about 10 miles, it's the entrance to Tampa Bay. You don't need any wonderful instrumentation to do that. Anybody can do it. Do north. That's what I believe why they ended up where they ended up. In the Relacion, it says, we came to land on Tuesday, the 12th of April, and went along the coast of the Way of Florida. By the way, the Way of Florida meant south. The Way of Ponico meant that way. When you're dealing with circle, you can't say I went east, south, north, or west, because it depends where you are. So they said to the navigators of the day, by way of Florida, was to go clockwise. By way of Ponoco, was to go counterclockwise around the Gulf. So they went by way of Florida, which is south. I believe that they sailed north from the Dry Tortugas. They saw land. They sailed south. There was a big opening in Boca Ciega Bay. It's all landfill now, all landfill, lots and lots of houses. I just erased them off the map. So you could see what, they, what it looked like. It was a bay. So here you're looking. You've been two months at sea. You've got four ships, 300 people. You want to get ashore. And there he sees smoke, Indian village at the back of a bay. He anchors outside the mouth of the bay, and he goes in and meets the Tokabaga Indians. One or two days after landing, he does an inland expedition. He goes north, northeast. He hits water. That's old Tampa Bay. He sees it. It's going inland. It's going that way. East is inland. So he's standing on the left side of that, and he's seeing a body of water going inland. And it doesn't look like that could possibly be attached to what's behind me, which is the Gulf of Mexico. But it is, right? You could sail down Tampa Bay, south, 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 go up this way, and you're in the Gulf. But he couldn't see that. He just thought it was a large bay that went inland, and he didn't pay any attention to it. So he gets up to Safety Harbor, and he finds many boxes from Castile and a bunch of European artifacts. He finds shoes, clothes, iron. He asked the Indians where it came from, and they said, oh, we got that off a shipwreck. Most historians have been satisfied with that answer. Oh, they got a bunch of cargo boxes off a shipwreck. I wasn't satisfied with that because I figured if it was the, the, the Ponce de Leon remnants, the Indians wouldn't have said, oh, those are guys we killed. You see? <laughs> they landed here, and we killed them all and drove them off, and this is their stuff. Uh, so, so they wouldn't have said that. They would have said, we found them. But I said... Maybe there's more to it than that. Maybe a whole bunch of cargo boxes didn't just go floating ashore in, in old Tampa Bay. Any of you boaters know that isn't going to happen. It isn't going to happen in old Tampa Bay. So that raised my suspicion that maybe there was something to this Cabeza de Vaca uh, story that hadn't been recognized, and that is he may have found something important there. Narvaez took his pilot, Mirello, and his shallow draft boat, a brigantine, and said, go south and find the opening to this huge bay that goes 30 miles inland. And if you don't find it, go down to Havana, pick up the ship that we were supposed to meet, come back with more supplies. So Mirello heads south. And what it said, these are his instructions. Go along the coast south, find the big bay. If you don't find it, keep going to Havana, get the other ship come back. Narvaez waits a couple of weeks. His, his pilot doesn't come back. So he goes, well, I guess it isn't down south. It must be north. So he decides he's going to go rejoin with his land people. He's taken 42 horses off a ship. Do you know, can you imagine what it was like to get 42 horses off ships offshore onto land? You're not going to get them back on the ship. You're not going to say, would you mind swimming out to the ship, Mr. Horsey, so that I can get you on the ship? So he's stuck. He's got 300 people, 42 horses ashore. He's got his ships there. He figures the bay is just to the north. So he sends his ships north, and he and his men walk north and says, see you at the big bay. And there's no bay. And that was the end of his expedition. That led to their disaster. There's no bay. Mirello comes back looking for, for Narvaez, and he says, five leagues below where we had landed, we found the port that entered seven or eight leagues inland. And it was the same one we found before, where we found the boxes from Castile. So here's what it looks like. 
Narvaez, Bogusia Gabe is where Narvaez landed. By the way, I'm supposed to be pronouncing it Narvaez. I know that, you Spanish guys, but we don't. You know, people get confused when I say Narvaez. As, so I say Narvaez. That's the way an American would, who doesn't use accent marks would pronounce it. But Narvaez went inland, goes to Safety Harbor, finds the boxes from Castile. Miruelo comes back later, goes to Bocasega Bay. The, uh, the Narvaez is gone, sails south five leagues, enters the bay, sails in, and finds the same place where they found the boxes from Castile. So that tells you where Safety Harbor is and where the two of them went. Here's where, what happened to the survivors. They started in Cuba, went to Tampa Bay, to Boca Ciega Bay. They walked all the way up to Apalachee Bay. They made boats. They sailed 800 miles along the southern coast of the United States. A storm hit them near Galveston. Only about 80 of them were left alive out of the 800 after that storm hit them. They washed ashore. The Indians killed a bunch of them. Some of them got, got isolated, cannibalized each other. Uh, some of them got ca captured and enslaved. And six years later, four of them were left. Cabeza de Vaca, Castillo, Durantes, and Estevanico. And they escape. They've been there for six years as, as captives, as slaves of the Indians. And they walked up to the area of the, where the top part of the map is. I don't know for sure how far they were up north they walked down to Sinaloa, Pacific Coast. They run into other Spaniards there. Spaniards say Mexico City is 1,000 miles to the south. They go to Mexico City, and that's where their journey ends. So my two questions were, the map has a Bay of Juan Ponce. Where is the Bay of Juan Ponce? Uh, and where did the boxes from Castile come from? Those were the things that were gnawing at me. Is there a linkage between what Norway has found and the missing Ponce de Leon expedition? Who's Juan Ponce? He came to the Indies in 1493 with Columbus's second expedition. His first expedition everybody knows about. His second one was 17 ships and 1,200 people to, to, to settle the Indies. And that's when Ponce de Leon came. He conquered Puerto Rico and was made the governor of it in 1508. He was displaced as Puerto Rico's governor in 1511. Let me tell you what happened. Christopher Columbus, when he left Spain, was told by Isabel and Ferdinand, you are admiral of the ocean sea. You are viceroy of all the lands that you discover, that you encounter. And so he found it. They rewarded him. He comes back. The headquarters is on the island of Hispaniola, and he becomes the worst tyrant ever. And within years, the king and queen rescind all of his powers. He's no longer the viceroy, no longer the admiral of the ocean sea. Meanwhile, Ponce de Leon, he's governor. Well, Christopher Columbus dies, and his son, Diego Columbus, goes to the crown and the court in Spain and says, hey, that, that stuff that you granted to my father passes from generation. It's permanent. It belongs to family forever. I am the viceroy now. That's the deal you made. I'm his son. He's dead. I'm going to be the viceroy. He argued with him for years and years. But in 1511, he won. And the crown said, yep, you're the viceroy. You go, of the Indies. Everything that you've discovered is yours. And they send him back, and he kicks poor Ponce de Leon out as governor of Puerto Rico. So poor, poor Ponce goes back to Spain to his friend, King Ferdinand, and they were friends. And says, this isn't fair. As governor of this island, you point this guy as viceroy, he kicks me out. The king says, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a consolation prize. You see, the viceroy of, of, of the Indies, Diego Columbus, is only the viceroy of everything he's discovered. He hasn't discovered anything north of Cuba. Now, there's, some, there's a place out there called Bimini and some other lands. I'm going to give you a contract, and you can go out there and discover everything north of Cuba, and I'll make you the governor of it. And the viceroy won't have any power over you. He's only got power over what he discovered. So Ponce de Leon comes back, discovers Florida. Now, there's no way that Ponce de Leon discovered Florida. The, the Spanish had been in the Bahamas since 1492. 
This is 1513. This is 21 years later. Nobody's gone from the Bahamas to, to Florida in 21 years. There were 300 Spanish ships sailing around here. They knew Florida was there, but nobody had claimed it. So he officially discovered it, although it had long been discovered. It was on maps going back to, the, to about 1500. So Juan Ponce gets, finds Florida, goes back to Spain again. The king knights him, the first conquistador to be knighted by the king. And he gets medals and awards, and he's now the governor of La Florida. So what does he do? He goes back to Puerto Rico, where he has a nice estate, and he stays there. He ignores Florida for the next eight years. And finally, in 1521, he decides it's time to settle Florida. I'm going to start an expedition. By the way, this is where they believe he landed, historians. You can see Charlotte Harbor. Below it is Caloosahatchee River. Above it is the Miaka River and the Peace River. Where, where the historians believe that he came in 1513 is Pine Island or Carlos Bay or Sanibel, which wasn't called Sanibel at the time. But in there is where they think that Ponce de Leon landed in 1513, got in a fight with the Calusa Indians, and they ran him out of town. The Charlotte Harbor theory is accepted. That's where he went uh, for 1521. I tried to find any historian that made an argument that in 1521, when Ponce de Leon went back to set up a full-time settlement, that made an argument that he went there, and I didn't. All I found in all the stuff was historians saying, you know, Joe Blow said that Juan Ponce probably went back in 1521 to the same place he went in 1513. And that's what I think probably what he did. That's, that's it. That's the research. He probably went back to the same place in 1521 that he'd gone to 1513 and being beaten by the Indians. Wouldn't, you like, wouldn't that be a great idea? Let's go back to the same place where the guys attacked us, cheated us, lied to us, set a trap for us, and set a colony there. I think that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard, but that's generally accepted as where he went. Did he, since he was the governor of Puerto Rico, are you telling me that he would go to a place that had shallow, shallow water, that had no fresh water, that had very hostile Calusa to set up a settlement? Would you do that? I say he would not. Was he stupid? There's no evidence that he was stupid. You'd have to be stupid, in my opinion, to say, let's load up a ship with pigs and horses and cows and women and children and vegetables and go land where we landed and got the heck beat, up, beat out of us eight years ago. What you would do if you were the governor of Puerto Rico and you'd been the governor for eight years is you would have sent scout ships over there many times to find out what's there. Where's a good anchorage? Where's a good harbor? Where's there fresh water? Where's there land I could use? You would know exactly where you were going. You wouldn't go, Duh, let's load a boat and go see what we see. You wouldn't do that. They had hundreds of ships sailing around in those days. You would not blindly say, let's head to Florida and maybe find a place to land. You would know where you were going to go. You would go to a place that had land and that had water and that had deep water that your ships could get in close to shore. Going back to this map, I saw that there was a Bay of Juan Ponce on that map, the, the, the map that was in Adorno's book. So they named this place the Bay of Juan Ponce. That's unusual. Places aren't usually named after people. They're named after a saint. They're named after a holy day. They're not named after a person. That's an honor. You would name that after him after he was dead to say this is the Bay of Juan Ponce. He was, a, he, was a, he was a knight. He was knighted by the king. He was a hero. He discovered Florida. That's his bay. So my, my theory was, that's probably what happened, but can I get a hold of a better map? I found in books published in the 1800s, reference to this book. This is, a, this is what the book looks like at my office. It is a book published in Germany 
1860 by a guy named J.G. Cole, and I read that it had maps in it, and the maps that J.G. Cole had copied were at the Grand Ducal Library in Weimar, Germany. They were a 1527 map and a 1529 map. They were the originals in the Ducal Library in Weimar, Germany. He borrowed the maps and copied them, and he wrote a book about them. And that's all I knew. So I tried to find out where can I get this book. I did a search for months on the internet. I finally found one dealer who had that book for sale. It was $3,000, and I bought it. And when I got the book and unfolded the two maps in the back, I saw the first map I saw was this one. It's two feet by three feet. There are copies of it in the back. There are scans of it on easels on the back. So when we finish up here, you can take a look at it. But Florida on that map is one inch by one inch. And there's four Toppermans on it. I don't know how they wrote that small, but they did. I've got the maps. They wrote that small. But that is what I saw, and I was absolutely shocked because it was so detailed. It had so much information on it. First thing I did was I had it scanned at high resolution. I brought it to an engineering firm and said, I want high-res scans because I want to be able to give this to other people. I want them to be able to see it. I want to be able to blow up sections of it so I can read it. So I had that done. I had the Gulf of Mexico area enlarged. It's dated 1527. It says, this is, this is where Narvaez is now going to populate. It's now. He's going now. And it had neat toppermans on Florida. I blew it up further. And it has, it has toppermans. You have to read it sideways. But it has Rio de la Paz, Peace River, Rio de Canoas, River of Canoas, Bahia de Juan Ponce, and they're written up from the thing. You can actually see the shape, probably, of the biggest bay that's on that map. That's the Bay of Juan Ponce. And it had two places in red, Rio de la Paz, Bay of Juan Ponce. <coughs> Have I got the right slide? No, I'm not. The Gulf of Mexico area was enlarged. I then enlarged the Florida area and saw this information. And I saw that the Bay of Juan Ponce was north of the Bay, the River of Peace, and the River of Canoes. And the important place names were in red. I then had big black and white prints made of it. I bought an engineering table because I had found on that map, you can't really see it on this piece of the map. You can't see it on that piece of the map. Can't see it on that piece of the map. But on this map, right here, is a latitude scale in every one degree. It has latitudes, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. So I got that board, and I simply got a sharp pencil, drew a line from latitude 27 to where it went from latitude 28, latitude 29. I only was dealing with three or four degrees of latitude, 26, 27, 28. That's where we are, Charlotte Harbor, Tampa Bay. And I looked at where they had Tampa Bay. They had it at 27.5 degrees. That is the latitude of Tampa Bay entrance. I looked at Rio de la Paz, and they had 26.5 degrees. That's the latitude of Charlotte Harbor. And I said, well, wow. Are they really that accurate? So I picked other places on the map. San Juan, Puerto Rico, Panuco, places that the Spaniards would go regularly and they'd have a real solid idea of what its position was. And I found the latitudes were within two-tenths of a degree. This is guys looking at stars or the sun 500 years ago. They were within two-tenths of a degree of GPS position. It was staggering. Here is what the latitudes were on the map, on Cone Bio, on the map is at latitude 28. The number in parentheses is the GPS latitude. GPS latitude is 28. Bay of Juan Ponce, map is 27.5. GPS, 27.5. River of Canoes, latitude on the map, 27. Latitude by GPS uh, for the Miyaka River, 27. Rio de la Paz, Charlotte Harbor entrance on the map 26.5, 
GPS 26.7. That's remarkable. I thought it was remarkable. That left me with the conclusion that the Rio de la Paz is the Peace River, which is Charlotte Harbor, and the Bay of Juan Ponce is Tampa Bay. Is there evidence that that's true? It's first seen on maps six years after Juan Ponce died. It's extremely rare to have a place named after a person. It's a high honor. Safety Harbor, they found a bunch of stuff that was remnants of people's possessions, shoes, shirts, iron pieces, uh, cargo boxes. And those two rivers are one degree, 70 miles south of the Bay of Juan Ponce, which happens to be the distance that those two rivers are south of Tampa Bay. Is there other evidence that the Bay of Juan Ponce was Tampa Bay? The Chavez Espejo. This was a book written by, for, man, for mariners. It was like a mariner's guide. It told you how to anchor, how to read, uh, how to declinations of sun to find your latitude and longitude, oh, not longitude, just latitude, uh, and directions for places and latitudes of places. And the Espejo, which is a book, they don't know the exact date, they think it's about 1535, says in it, the Bay of Juan Ponce is at 27.3 degrees, two-tenths of a degree different from what it actually is. It also has a Rio de la Paz one degree south of the Bay of Juan Ponce, 70 miles. That's where it is. Another map, and I didn't even mention this map, the book had two maps. Another map also has the Bay of Juan Ponce, and it has a Rio de la Paz and the River of Canoes 70 miles south of the Bay of Juan Ponce. When Juan Ponce sailed in 1521, do a settlement. The, my question is, was it a settlement expedition or was it a conquest expedition? There are two kinds. Conquest expedition, you bring a lot of horses, a lot of soldiers, a lot of weapons. Settlement, you bring cows and sheep and pigs, stuff like that. He brought mares and calves and pigs and sheep and goats, all manner of domestic animals, two ships, 200 people. Certainly not a force that could go conquer the Calusa that it's seen in 1513, would make, that would be impossible. The question is, did he really establish a settlement? He left Puerto Rico on February 20th, 1521. We know that from letters he wrote to the king and others saying when he left, so we know that fact. We know that in July, early July, 1521, he arrives in Havana having been wounded by Indians and dies. So what happened between February 20th, 1521, with two ships, with 200 people, and all those animals on it, what happened during that five-month period? Did they sail around in circles for five months and end up back in Cuba? Or did they land someplace and establish a settlement for three or four months and then get driven off? Virtually every historian that I've looked at says he landed someplace, and he had a settlement for three and a half or four months. and then got in a fight for some reason with the Indians. The Indians kicked him out of town. So we know he had to have landed somewhere. Would he sail around for four months? They were never 50 miles away from land. If you look at this, look at all the land. Why would you sail around for four months and not land? You wouldn't do that. It's just not possible that they left in February 1521. He ends up in July. March, April, May, June, sailing around in circles. So the evidence is that he landed somewhere up there, Tampa Bay or Charlotte Harbor, for three or four months. Is there any evidence that Ponce de Leon landed any place else in 1521? The answer is no. There is no evidence no evidence that he landed any place else. Uh, it's, it's a theory that it doesn't make sense. The Calusa were hostile. They had rebuffed all other European efforts. Other Europeans had landed there and got driven off by the, by the Calusa. Uh, there's no fresh water there. The water's too shallow for large ships. No artifacts have been found down there. No written records support a theory that he went there. There is no evidence that he landed anywhere in the Charlotte Harbor area. 
but there are a lot of reasons they wouldn't have landed there that I've covered. Was the Bay of Juan Ponce the portion of Tampa Bay that we now know as Old Tampa Bay? Yes, I believe it was. The Relacion, the map I showed you earlier, said that Mir Miruelo, when he went back looking for Ponce de Leon, found the same place, entered the bay, went all the way to the end of the bay, and found the place they had found many boxes from Castile when Narvaez had landed in Boca Ciega Bay. So that's one piece of evidence. Records from the Hernando de Soto expedition by a guy named Herrera say that the, that the Bay of Juan Ponce was 30 miles east of the entrance to Tampa Bay. Now, where could you be on an entrance to a bay and be 30 miles east of, 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 of another bay? Only Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay, you go 25 miles inland, you turn left, there's another bay. That's the Bay of Juan Ponce, in my opinion, the original Bay of Juan Ponce. The last scholarly work on this subject was done by Robert Fusan, who is a professor at USF. He died in 2004. It's a wonderful book. It's, very, it's, it's a tremendous resource. He wrote, it's unlikely that Juan Ponce would have gone to Pine Island or any of the places he'd gone in 1513. He and I agree on that one. Second thing he said was, on sun maps drawn a century after Juan Ponce's second voyage, Tampa Bay is labeled the Bay of Juan Ponce. This has caused a number of people to jump to the conclusion that Juan Ponce's colony was somewhere in the shores of Tampa Bay. I believe that if Fusan saw those maps that were dated not 100 years later, but six years later, he would have changed his assumption. I believe he got that wrong. I think it's the only thing I found that he got wrong. What does Charlotte Harbor Historical Society say? Well, my book was published, Tampa Bay Times wrote a big article about it. And one of the, the reporter called the president of the Charlotte Harbor Historical Society and said, this guy thinks Ponce de Leon landed in safety harbor at Old Tampa Bay. What do you think? And he said, I never believed he had settled here. I believe any proof that leads to safety harbor. That's what the president of the Charlotte Harbor Historical Society said. And his bigger quote says, and the reason is, there's no fresh water here. You can't have a settlement without water. So the evidence that I believe is overwhelming <laughs> is that he landed here. <laughs> and that beautiful park, and it is a beautiful park. There's a lot of great pictures of it on the internet with a nice statue and signs. Uh, is nice, but wrong. Uh, the, and the statue should be here, and the park should be here. Uh, I believe that the evidence, and when you go to court, you deal with evidence. In a murder trial, it has to be without any, any reasonable doubt. In other trials, it just has to be, what does the preponderance of evidence show? In my opinion, the preponderance of evidence is that Juan Ponce de Leon did come in 1521 to Tampa Bay he set up a colony for three and a half months. He was expelled by the Calusa, sailed a few hundred miles south, and died there. And that no historian that I have found has referred to that map. All the research that I've seen has been done without reference to a map, any map. I think that's staggering. But when you think about it, that book cost me $3,000. <laughs> How many people can do that? And so I think I'll send 3, 000, spend $3,000 and maybe I'll get something interesting. Not many. Not many young professors doing research at universities. Not many uh, amateurs that are just wondering. Uh, that's probably why nobody's seen that. There were very few of those books printed. I tried to find out how many were published. All I can find out is there's 45 of them in the world, and they're in libraries. They're in university libraries. They're in institutional libraries. I don't know anybody that's got one. There is none in Florida. So if you're a researcher in the state of Florida and you want to see the map, you can't see it. So what I did, because I have believed in the scientific research method, that if I come to a conclusion, I want, you, I want you to be able to test it. I want you to be able to test it with your, your own devices. 
So I went to the University of Florida, and I got them to put the maps online. Anybody can see them. About 800 people have seen them since I put them online about 10 months ago. 800 people. Maps that have never been seen, probably by a Florida historian. They can get them. They can print them. They can get their own latitude scales out. They can do their own calculations. They can come up with their own theories. I believe that they will come to the same conclusion that I did, that the boxes in Safety Harbor were boxes left over from the from the Ponce de Leon uh, failed expedition. The shoes and the cloth were people that things they took off the people they killed. And they didn't tell Narvaez that because they were themselves captives. When Narvaez went there, he captured those Indians and said, where did this come, this come from? There is no way that they would have told him the truth. They would have said, oh, we just found them somewhere. So I believe that the compelling evidence is that they landed here. It's not proof. But it's a start at proof. I hope that other people, students, researchers, historians, take this and find fault with it, dig deeper into it, come up with another conclusion, come up with a different idea. Uh, and I'd welcome arguing with them about it. I've argued with myself about it because I don't have an opponent right now. I don't have anybody <laughs> proposing that it was any place else. Uh, so uh, it would be more fun to have someone challenge you, and you could play tit for tat and show them how much stuff you have and the books you've got and the research you've done. Right now, I just have people say, yeah, that's interesting. I hope it gets beyond that's interesting. I tried to, to get the, the city of St. Petersburg to put a monument up representing the first inland exploration of the United States. I think that's really significant. The fact that an African slave was one of the four survivors is incredibly significant. The fact that he discovered Arizona and New Mexico is incredibly significant. Those are neat things that you should celebrate. That's why I wrote the first book. I wrote it just to convince them to do that. Failed. I didn't write this book to, call it to, to do anything. I wrote this book because I was just writing research saying, isn't this cool? Wow, I didn't know this. And I found this map, and I said, I've got to put this out there for other people in the world to have access to. If you have a digital online one, I'd love for you to put it here. Uh, the uh, University of Florida was delighted to get it, and I think that other people, once they examine it, are going to come to the same conclusion that I did. Ponce de Leon came to Tampa Bay in 1521. He arrived in about March. He was here till early July. He set up a settlement. He got along for a while with the Tocobaga Indians. Something went wrong. I suspect that what went wrong is men and women. These are all young Spanish men, and there were a lot of young Indian women. And that's, you're asking for problems with the young Indian men when that happens. It's not on any history books, but the young Spanish men were after the young Indian women, and the young Indian men didn't like that very much. And I think that's the, that's the basis that probably started the fight. So that's my conclusion, and uh, thank you all for listening. I hope I at least made a dent in what you think. If you have questions. Yeah, uh, so if anybody has any questions, I'm up here in the back now. Um, I'll, I'll um, bring you the microphone so the, the question can be read on camera, and then uh, Mr. Medjool can answer it. Is there any evidence exactly where in Safety Harbor this was? No, uh, I don't think we'll ever have that happen. Uh, the, here's the reason why. When, when Narvaez went to Safety Harbor and he found the many boxes from Castile, there were bodies in those boxes. And the five priests that were with him when he got there decided that they, were, they, had, they had leather skins over them that were painted. Uh, and the priests decided that that was uh, idolatry. So they burned them. They burned all the boxes that had the bodies in them. And some people have assumed that those bodies were Spaniards, maybe that were in a shipwreck. I think that's malarkey. I think the, the Indians wouldn't have given that veneration to a body, a Spanish body they found washed up on the shore. They would have used those cargo boxes for coffins because they had to have a guard out. That what they did with their dead was they left them to decompose and then they defleshed them, and they took their bones, and they buried them in, in burial mounds, just the bones. So they had these places for the dead that they had to put a guard at to keep the wolves away from eating their dead. And I think when they found all these cargo boxes, which happened to be six feet long, two feet wide, two feet high, 
That's what a cargo box size was. Coffins, put them in there. That helps keep the wolves and other animals away from their dead. That's why I think there were bodies in those boxes that Narvaez discovered. If they had been Christians uh, or Spaniards, the priests would not have burned them. Uh, it has, that has been forbidden by the Catholic Church until 1983. You weren't allowed to do that. And even in 1983, when the Catholic Church finally allowed for it, for cremation, they said you have to take the remains and put them in sacred ground. Uh, so certainly in 1528, the priests would not have ordered boxes containing Spaniards, Christians, to be burned. What they did is they burned boxes that had Indian bodies in it. And when you think about it, it's just a few sentences in the Relacion. You have to think about what really happened here. The Spaniards go up to the sacred Indian place. They go to the place where the bodies are of their dead, and they burn them. So that wasn't a happy day. That wasn't a happy experience. This wasn't a friendly encounter between the Spaniards and the Indians. This was oppressors against oppressed. In the Relacion, he never talks about that. He uses Cabeza de Vaca, says, we took four Indians. We asked him this. And then a couple of days later, we took five Indians. We asked him where this was. And then a few days later, we took six Indians. He never says what happens to the Indians. By the time he gets up to Appalachia, he's taken 14 Indians. He never says we killed them, we let them loose. They just disappear from the narrative. I think that the Spaniards, Narvaez was certainly noted brutal oppressor of Indians from his conquest of Cuba, where he slaughtered hundreds of Indians. Uh, he probably used the same tactics when he landed here. He probably uh, acted like a conquistador and captured the Indians he wanted, uh, burned what he felt like burning, and uh, that was the end of that. I don't think you'll find any remnants of those boxes that they burned because they would not have been on a mound. We have mounds now that they're excavating, but th those dead would not have been on a mound. Those dead would have been out in the woods a little, it's a stinky place, all these bodies. So you'd have them away. And when you burn them, they'd be just on the ground. So there's probably a road or a parking lot over in Safety Harbor under which if you dug, you'd find signs of burned wood you know, if you dug enough, cause, but, but I don't think that'll ever happen. I don't, I, and I don't think even I would, would argue that he landed exactly where the Tacobaga tribe was. I would argue that he landed somewhere on the shores of old Tampa Bay. And that, that's how the Indians in the village of Tacobaga ended up with those cargo boxes. They could have taken them from anywhere on the shores of old Tam Tampa Bay pretty easily. Any other questions from anybody? Let me look up you in the front, and then we'll move to the back. Here you go. I don't think I quite understand about the map. You said there were the wonderful map that you found in the book that you had to buy for three thousand dollars. Right. There's only forty-five books in existence. That that, that are known to be in existence. Okay. Was two. there some original map somewhere? Yes. Yes. That you mentioned it was yes. in Germany. Yes. In Weimar Germany. There's a, a, was a grand ducal library in Weimar, Germany, where they had tremendous collection of books and maps. This guy, this German historian, went to that duke and borrowed those original maps, the 1527 and 1529 maps, and copied them. And then he wrote a book about them. And the book is in German, and it's 160,000 words just about those, those maps. Uh, that's a lot. This book is maybe 35,000 words. Does the private map collection still exist? Yes. Yes. So As a matter of fact, you can, has that map. you can go online to the, and it's, it's, it's in the book, tells you, even gives you a website. You can go online and see those original maps. The problem with those original maps is they're very faded. So if you compare those original maps with these maps, you can see they're the same. But the one that has been folded in the back of the book for 160 years is nice and clear. And the one they've had out in the light for 160 years is very faded. But you can see the headings. You can see the outlines of land masses. You can see some of the toponyms. And you can actually go online. It's called the Anna Amelia Library um, in Weimar. And they have them online. They have the book online, too, if you can read German. Can people visit the library? I don't think so. I don't think they will see, show you those maps. The problem with this particular book 
is this book is in the rare book section of universities. So even if you're a historian and you want to do it, you're going to go to a university and say, can you get this book? Can I look at it? They'll say, sure, you can look at it. You can't take it home with you. So now you open the book, and in the back, tucked in the back, are these two maps that are this big. What are you going to do with them? You know, take notes? Uh, so it's just inaccessible. Uh, up until recently, no historian could see them. It just wasn't. So that's why historians wrote history books without talking about maps in heaven. Now they've got two online, University of Florida. All right, another one over here. Yeah, question? You, you talked about the, uh, the scout ships and then also these, these two main ex expeditions. Yes. Um, I know you know uh, Michael Francis, and, um, is it po and he sends graduate students to Havana and Spain every year. Is there any, is there any, you're probably doing this already, is there any way that they can guide some of their research to try to find some of this other evidence? I've talked to him many times about this. He has a passion for St. Augustine. That's really what he wants to know. He wants to know every brick in St. Augustine, where it came from, and who put it in place, and what kind of mortar did they use and the grandmother and grandfather of every person that ever lived in St. Augustine. That's what he wants to do. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but that's, that's his thing, is St. Augustine. It's not my thing. Uh, I don't know much about St. Augustine. You know, first permanent colony in the United States, great, 1565. I've been there. It's a neat place. He knows names of who lived in what building. So although he and I have talked about it, and he said, if I've come across something, I'll let you know. And by the way, I sent him these maps. I sent him. High res, high, high, high res scans of these maps. 270 megabytes in one map. That's a lot of, that's a lot of data. Uh, I sent them to him when I got them. And I said, you know, these maps have never been seen by historians. Do you know how, look at the maps when you leave the room. In South America, there's hundreds of toponyms. Along the Gulf Coast, there's 40 toponyms. Historians haven't seen them. There are people in Louisiana, Texas, Alabama, that will know, oh my God, there's that river. Oh, that, you, when I looked at the map, I sailed over to the Cozumel, to, to, to Isla Mujeres. Have any of you been on that race they have from St. Pete over to Mexico across the Gulf? I sailed in that, to Isla Mujeres. Isla Mujeres is on that map, it says Isla Mujeres. Cozumel is on that map, that 1527 map. That's really cool. I don't know if the people in Cozumel know that they were on a map in 1527. I don't know if anybody who's writing Mexican history knows those maps exist. It's really unfortunate because there's not another book you can buy. But it is fortunate that we live in a digital age where you can, at the touch of a finger, you can have that whole map for nothing. Stuff that, that, that Robert Fusan would have given his eye teeth for when he was writing his history book, you can have now. And that's what I think has made my voyage so much fun, is that I have more power at my fingertips to get information that the most prominent professor of history and the most excellent researcher had 20 years ago. I can bury him. I can bury him. Uh, it's true, and my two professors know that that's true. Not because I'm smarter than they are, because I have the internet. And I can simply say, map 1527, bang, I have it. They wouldn't have known it existed. They'd go to their librarian and say, hey, have you got any books about the Spanish entry into North America? Yeah, I've got a couple here. Look at this. That's how they do things. That's why universities were important. They had more books. That's what made the difference between one university and another, the one that had the more books won. That's how it worked. Today, the great equalizer, the internet, all have the same number of books. Uh, one more question right but here. those particular books, there are two websites that are listed in my book that have books that are in libraries. So if you look for the title of that book in German, it'll say, these are the universities that have that book. These are the institutions that have that book. So you can find that there's 45 of them in the world in institutions. Of those that are in private hands, I have no idea. I do know, as a book collector, I've been a book collector for a long time, that what happens when you have books with maps in them is people tear the maps out and frame them, put them on the wall, throw the book away. Uh, and uh, uh, these would be difficult because they're so big. I don't know many people want a two-foot by three-foot map. Uh, but I think I suspect that that's probably what the outcome of these books, most many of them were. My book belonged to the, to the American Geographical Society. 
uh, it says stamped in it and it's stamped on the maps. In 1876, they got rid of it as a duplicate. So that's its origin. They had two and they only needed one. Uh, that's the kind of institution that would have bought these books. It wouldn't have been a person, wouldn't buy a 160,000 word, uh, word book in German uh, for fun. It would be institutions, research places that would buy them. That's where I believe they probably only printed 60, 70 of them. If you look at those maps, those maps are handwritten. There are words, I don't know how you can write that small, but they had to write that small to put all those names on the map. Uh, th these people were, were tremendously talented that made these maps. And when you look at the latitude scale, you just marvel. I actually dealt with astronomers and bought astrolabes to learn how they calculated uh, uh, their, their latitude back in the early 1500s. Do you know, if you look at the North Star, you think it's in one spot in the sky. It isn't. It goes around a little circle. The little circle has a radius of seven-tenths of one degree. That's the radius. 500 years ago, the, the radius of that circle was three and a half degrees. Three and a half degrees. Seven degrees from side to side. So if you looked at the North Star and you did everything perfectly, you could still be seven degrees off because it would depend on what time of night you did it. But you know what? They knew that, and they had tables to correct for it. They knew what the radius was and how to correct for it based on the time of night. It's just staggering. Any right, other we questions? Have, we, have, we have another one. Jim, have you been to the place over on Park Street where there's the sure. big sign that says this yeah. is where Navarez? Yeah, I believe uh, that's probably very close to where yeah, the Narvaez expedition landed. It's called Rodney Sacred and, Grounds. Yeah, Rodney and Tom and I went over there. How long ago was it? Yeah, they have, the guy has a Quonset hut there. And yep. yeah, he'll go on and on and on about it. There are Indian mounds there that they have uh, recovered stuff from. That's very close. That is on Boca Ciega Bay. There are Indian mounds there. Uh, we know that when Narvaez landed, he found an Indian village uh, the Indian villages at the time all had mounds for the chief. So it's very plausible that, it, that, that that is where he landed. Certainly he would have landed within two miles of there. So that's, that's a pretty good bet that, that that's where it happened. And they do have a sign. And it says this is where the first white man yes. uh, discovered, uh, uh, entered America. All right. So. Are there any more questions? Yeah, okay. I'll be right over there for this. <clears throat> if I were to describe your lecture tonight with one word, I would use the word amazing. It is amazing. And if I were to select the Cabeza de Vaca award for walking the extra mile in research, you'd be the number one pick. You'd be the researcher. <laughs> Coming from a Pegasus professor at the University of Central Florida, the largest university in the United States, that's quite a compliment. Thank you, sir. Thank you all very all much. Right. It's been a Thank pleasure. Thank you all so very much. much.